Hello, my name is Justin Bright, and welcome to Kerbal Space Program version 1.8.1 in my Next Small Step RP1 Career Mode playthrough. And we are picking up basically where we just left off with the launch of another Surveyor, not a Surveyor, an Intrepid uh, probe, which is intended now to head up to an interplanetary encounter. So we are just getting up to our, um, getting up to our launch countdown. One second. Ignition. And we have liftoff, and we have cleared the tower. Fabulous. So yeah, this is uh, another one. This is the third uh, Intrepid that I have thrown. The first two have failed anonymously, but that's RP1. That's kind of just how these things happen. Uh, so you'll see I'm kind of just time warping through this launch because we've we've done it a bunch of times. And uh, it's really just down to whether or not one of these boosters is going to fail on me. Uh, will tell us um, how this entire mission is going to perform. Um, we have used up most of our transfer window, so this, I think, is, if not our last shot, it's real close to it. So, all right, we are just heading on up and just about at our booster cutoff. Oh, my... What? <laughs> what? Wow. <laughs> okay. So, I guess there was a shutdown on one of my side boosters and I was at 4x time warp and I just I didn't even react in time. <laughs> but I guess we're still going to orbit? Question mark. Holy crap. Wow. Okay. Um yeah, I I guess I guess we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> for certain definitions of fine. Um, yeah, so I can say that that's probably never happened before. Uh, I think I can authoritatively say that it's never uh, been something that a rocket has recovered from. But we were at 60 kilometers and Kerbal Space Program was like, nah, you're fine. You just whip around and get back on track and whatever. It's no big deal. You've got good verniers on there. You can handle it. Not a big deal. Um, yeah, so somehow my rocket did not tear itself apart after that delightful maneuver. And um, I was pretty close to uh, booster separation anyways. Uh, so, sure. I guess we're just going to see. And main engine cut off. Solar panels are activating and we are now coasting up to our... Um, our orbital insertion burn. And we have ignition. And there we go. We are getting ourselves into a good orbit, I guess, with a decent amount of delta V left. Man, I'm going to have to go look at the tape and see how, how close we were to uh, stage burnout that that didn't destroy us completely and throw us totally off course. But man... I, I, I can't even believe that that happened. And I just, I mean, I can believe that that happened. That happens all the time. We've, we've seen that happen. What I can't believe is that I haven't, uh, thrown myself completely out of orbit in the process of, um, uh, of that happening. Like, usually that's an instant mission failure. All right, so 10 more seconds until we cut off uh, this burn. We are, looks like we are doing a little bit of a janky uh, inclination uh, adjustment here, which I don't super love, but I think it's, think it's probably fine. I'll disengage autopilot. We don't need to stress about uh, finishing off with RCS, but thank you very much for the attempt. Okay, so um, I am almost 100% certain that we have lost Mars for this... Um, for this attempt. So I'm going to set Mars's target and you can see that it's it's gone. Like there's nothing left. Uh, the ASAP burn is uh, 4.9 kilometers per second, which we just don't, we just don't have. Our rotating, that is not like that. Stop it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's lost. That's gone. Uh, we are also slightly past, um, 
the optimal uh, window that I had targeted for my Venus flyby. But I think that we are still, like you can see that this one has a shape that's kind of like a, you know, kind of like a black hole with the, the jets that shoot out the top and bottom. Um, looks like we are still right within uh, this one here. And I'll bet you if we do ASAP, yep, 3.6 kilometers per second, and that would be just fine. Uh, yeah, so let's plan for that. All right, so we are warping around to our burn time, and we're going to find out once again uh, how this Agena B is going to treat us. So we have a less than 6% chance to fail. All right, well, let's give this one more try. I had some weird issues with MechJab just a moment ago, and I had to save and reload, which is exactly why I do that. I try to make sure that I don't, like, save scum, basically. So I don't, I try not to, like, save and load my way out of test failures and things like that. But uh, I do keep extra saves to make sure that uh, I don't fall foul of really weird bugs. Um, I think that's totally fair game to reload a save for. Uh, a game like this that is as uh, stable as we all know KSP to be is something that um, I think means you can't in any real way do, um, uh, what do you call it? Do like an Iron Man thing where you have just the one save that you use. You back up KSP all the time. That's how you do it. All right, so we are coming around and... We have uh, the same less than 6% chance of success or failure, I guess. Um, we are ulging up. Oh, man. This basically determines whether or not we're going to get to Venus. And we have ignition. Yes. All right. So we are burning towards Venus. Fabulous. All right. So that should work unless, you know, it fails on the way, which would which would be terrible, but is a thing that happens. Uh, but it looks like we have a nice, really quick trajectory on our way out to Venus, which is pretty exciting. And we are uh, going to be burning into a nice, hopefully close trajectory, but we have on here, and I'll show you the probe once this thing actually succeeds, because if this thing just blows up again, then I'm not <laughs> gonna waste everybody's time talking about a probe that is not gonna work. Um, but once we, uh, hopefully we're gonna get to Venus and we're gonna get a nice close flyby so that we can get lots of good science uh, on the way out there. Um, so I love the uh, Agena engine as far as uh, its design specs, but man, that failure rate has not been kind to me. Um, it has taken a bunch of tries for us to get to this point, and I guess I could have done, well, I know I could have done more testing, but um, gosh, uh, yeah, that was a, a bunch of failures right in a row, which is not, not optimal. Um, there's other engines that I could have used that would have probably been better, um, even theoretical configurations that might have worked a little bit better than this one, but... Uh, I find myself constrained a little bit by not just what I know and what I feel comfortable talking about, but also, there we go, we are getting interplanetary, uh, but um, I feel constrained by what I can actually make happen, if that makes sense. Uh, I am going to... Well, we can we can finish this with RCS. I think that's fine. Uh, but I I feel constrained by what I can make happen with the numbers. So there's certain things that where I'll follow like the historical design, and I will do my best to um, I'll do my best to recreate it or make something similar or make something that it makes obvious sense with uh, the parts that I have available. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's the optimal best choice and best combination of parts out of all of the ones that we have uh, that we have here uh, there may very well be much better designs that I could have put together um, but it's also it's also fine like that's that's a big part of the game like your vessels are probably not going to look like mine and I definitely don't recommend you just recreate everything that I make uh, you could and it, it will get you at least to where I am now where I'm having all these failures <laughs> All right, so what I am doing now is we are, I think we're there. I think we've done it. Have we done it? It looks like we've done it. Oh my gosh. We have a probe that is heading interplanetary. We are going to scream past Venus and I am going to be able to tighten up this, um, uh, this par uh, parasite. Yeah, we, we're going to tighten up this parasite a little bit on a future um, 
correction burn uh, that will get us into a nice, uh, hopefully into a nice um, low trajectory uh, that does not touch the atmosphere, but does get a little bit of low science um, that we can send back. So that will be exciting and we will toy with that. And we have almost 300 meters per second of Delta V with which to do it. All right, so we've got our solar panels pointing at the sun. We are all ready to go. I can just go ahead and separate and I'm gonna activate the avionics and we are going to not have any connection whatsoever. I should have, I should have known. But there we go, I was able to burn for, you know, a fraction of a second to get just a tiny bit of separation from the booster stage. And there we have it. All right, so as we drift slowly away from the Agena upper stage, which has finally succeeded with uh, for us, uh, we can take a look at our spacecraft um, although we don't have, we don't have control yet, so I'll be doing some, uh, adju uh, adjustments to the orbit and the orbital trajectory on the way to Venus, uh, at some point, but right now we can just take a look at the spacecraft itself. So you can see down here, we have just the, uh, generic 0.4 kilonewton engine, uh, on there that is pushing out hydrazine, which, uh, of course is the, the stuff to use. Um, we have some nice big solar panels because we just unlocked the new uh, hinged solar panels. Um, so that, this is the RO solar uh, variant on these solar panels. So they are lovely and very pretty and they're hinged, which is very exciting because uh, that makes it a lot easier for me to point a whole bunch of solar panels at the same uh, in the same direction. Uh, I'm using a just a little toroid tank for my hydrazine because I did not need much like you really do not want a lot of fuel and I wanted to make sure that the weight of this craft was fairly low. You'll see that the total spacecraft weight is about 319 kilograms, which is actually a bit of a chonker compared to the real Mariner 2, which is what I'm kind of uh, likening this uh, this mission to. Uh, the real Mariner 2 was only uh, a little bit more than 200 kilograms. So we've packed on basically everything I possibly could uh, because I had the Delta V for it. Um, if I could get the darn Agena stage to work, we had plenty of del Delta V, like I said. Uh, but yeah, we have... Uh, had lots of fuel and a nice capable upper stage that was able to push out, um, I think, every single science experiment that I have, which is pretty darn neat. And we don't have connection and we are not going to have connection for some time because the only um, signal that this thing has is this big dish. And this is an S-band dish. So that is the new, uh, the new latest and greatest on... Um, communications technology that is able to uh, communicate back to Earth. Yeah, so you can see here with real antennas that we have an actual cone that um, emanates from our vessel towards the place that it is pointing. And you can see that we are now almost directly over one of the deep space network ground stations, which uh, with a technology level three S-band uh, connection gives us 82.5 kilobits per second. Holy crap, that is so fast. That is so good. Um, obviously, we're not going to have that good of a connection when we get out into the orbit of Venus, but, um, you know, is what it is. Uh, we have a fantastic connection now, which is, which is great. So I can turn on the RCS and turn on the avionics. Well, I actually don't need to turn on the avionics. We're pointed the way that I want to be pointed, so we don't need to, uh, uh, rotate around just for fashion's sake. But now that we have all that uh, set up, we can actually take a look at some of the experiments that we have packed on here. And like I said, it is literally everything that you can get from orbit and uh, from low orbit and high orbit around a, a particular planet. So we've got temp scan, pressure scan, micrometeorite, cosmic ray, radiometry, magnetic scan, mass spectrometry, orbital perturbation, and the uh, prepackaged telemetry and supersonic flight. All right, and then kind of going a little further on the actual design on here, uh, obviously I have some of the science experiments actually tacked on to the outside because I needed a lot. That's This is more than four, and you can only pack four inside of a probe uh, using Kerbalism. Uh, so we have a bunch of them on the outside as well. Uh, the ones that are a little bit less unwieldy, um, and I... I really like using the um, custom procedural uh, 
probe cores instead of just using avionics and then having it be shaped in a polygon or whatever. Like it looks, it just looks so much better. It makes me feel like I'm actually flying spacecraft instead of featureless polygons that I'm hurling into the into space. Uh, but the downside is that it doesn't have the center of mass adjustment built into it. So that means that I had to, like I packed on um, these experiments on this side, these uh, three experiments on this side, and then I just adjusted the position of this antenna like very slightly uh, to get it perfectly centered. And that seems, that seems to have worked just fine. So we are all set with 277 meters per second. And uh, yeah, let's see what we need to do to get a better orbit. So our flyby contract wants us to get within 20,000 kilometers. So that's 20 million meters that we need to get uh, get to. Uh, we are at 128 million, million meters right now. So that is not going to do it. So as we know from stock Kerbal Space Program, uh, we can make just tiny adjustments to our trajectory uh, anywhere on the way between here and Venus, and that is going to um, have a big effect on our final on our final trajectory and what our final flyby looks like. Yeah, I'm wondering how much I can tell what side of the planet I'm going to be on at any given time, because I don't need to make any burns, and we've determined that I can do science even if I don't have connection. Uh, so anyways, just picking this um, spot arbitrarily, anywhere on here is probably fine. Let's just take a look and see what um, making some small changes to our orbit would do. So yeah, just a couple, just a handful of delta V in any particular direction really makes a very large impact and will hopefully, look at that, beautiful. Yeah, so we have, it's, it is going to be no problem whatsoever to get ourselves into a very interesting low orbit around Venus, which, let's see. All right, so it looks like the space high environment for Venus is 6 million meters. So we want to dip below that and see what kind of good science we can get. Um, but one thing I just want to show you, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do anything with this, but take a look at how this, uh, how much this uh, trajectory deflects around Venus. Like, this is the stuff that um, gravity assists are made of, because just by flying into this orbit, we are changing our trajectory by a, such a huge amount. Like, that is just a huge deflection that that is um, that is moving up. That's like 40, 45 degrees, something like that. I don't have my protractor with me, but uh, it's a pretty significant amount. And that is the kind of thing that you can use to make uh, flybys, which is something that was defi is definitely done in real life for almost all space missions that are of any kind of significance. Uh, because it's either that or you just like freaking hurl your spacecraft as far as you possibly can on the biggest rocket you possibly can and then just you get what you get. But if you use a flyby trajectory, uh, you can make a pretty significant change. And you see, like, when we get close, like, look at how much that deflects my orbit. Like, that changes what my orbit's going to be. Like, with just the application of 10 meters per second by getting really close to Venus. So this is, I think, actually through, nope, just like a really tight, like, actually, that's pretty fantastic. Let's just see how low we can go, because uh, the atmosphere of Venus. Oh, man, how cool would this be? Uh, so I think this should be above Venus's atmosphere, but gosh, look at that. That's like a 90 degree turn that our spacecraft would make dipping into that dipping into that and it basically circularizes like remember that we were we're coming from like our initial orbit looks like this so it it's a an ellipse um but that like practically circularizes and also throws our orbit off radial a little bit so that's not something that is useful to us particularly but if i were to tweak this around i bet you i could find um a way to swing around venus to send us somewhere interesting 
All right, so this is just an example of something crazy. Like I'm, I, like I said, I don't think we're gonna be able to do anything super interesting with this flyby, but just for example, look at this. Just with this extreme flyby where I am dipping just above the atmosphere of Venus and we are being flung out at a very severe angle, um, without spent with only spending about 100 meters per second of delta v just to get that precise orbit i was able to shave off uh enough of my orbital velocity to uh relative to the sun to bring down my pair my para my perihelion by 75 million kilometers i was able to reduce my uh my perihelion just with just with this flyby so that's huge, and that almost gets us to Mercury. And like I said, I, I'm not sure that I'll be able to do that, but man, how cool would that be? Um, but yeah, so that's the kind of thing that you can do with flybys. Uh, there are tools that help you to find the correct flybys and what kind of trajectory you need to actually get something useful out of it. Like I could play with this until I find something that's kind of fun and I'll probably do that. Um, but I have no idea if this flyby is actually useful for anything. All right, so that is what I am going to do. We're just gonna spend a little bit of Delta V to lower our orbit uh, with relation to the sun. And maybe we'll get another flyby someday. And if so, then we'll, you know, we'll see uh, if there's anything interesting that we can do. But we're more likely to have the solar panels burn out before we can do anything super interesting with it. But all that said, this is plenty interesting. And uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm just going to put down a node a alarm clock node to handle this burn, which is coming up uh, in relative time very, very quickly, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, we've got that coming and you can see now Earth, we are pointed at it and communicating with it the best we can. Solar panels facing the sun, dish pointing at Earth. And this, uh, like I've mentioned before, this is a little bit similar to uh, the Mariner 2 mission, which is um, the first uh, probe that we were able to send out, the Americans were able to send out past Venus. It was the first robotic space probe to complete any kind of planetary, successful planetary encounter. Um, so I think the Soviets got really close and like flung something nearby, but there was some some mishap or another. I didn't look too much into that, but uh, it, they're not the absolute first one to be out in that vicinity, but they're the first one to do it successfully. Uh, let's get a nice shot of Earth while I babble about this. Um, so yeah, we uh, we sent this out in 1962, and that, uh, like I've said, we are way behind. But now that I think about it, that's actually exactly right as far as the level of technology that we have. So yeah, I'll call that a win. We are <laughs> we are at least tracking to the level of technology that we have unlocked, which is pretty cool. Um, but it had it also did have a hexagonal uh, bus, so it's not too dissimilar to what we have here. But it had um, it had instrument booms. It had like magnetometers hanging off of it. Uh, it had solar panels. It had a big. Um, it had a dish that didn't look anything like this one, but it was a large uh, extendable dish uh, where this kind of sort of has the same general shape where it has the hexagonal bus, it has the solar panel sticking off one side, um, and then it had the, the dish that is uh, extends off from the, from the center and then the little engine bus on the bottom there. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of similar and you'll see a picture. I'll have a picture of it over here somewhere perhaps. Um, when uh, I'm, I'm recording. So we'll take a look at that. Um, but yeah, it had um, micrometeorite sensors, plasma sensors, charge particle sensors, which is the only thing that I'm not sure that we have, although that might be the ion mass spectrometer now that I think about it. Um, and it had a magnetometer, which I think it's probably a little bit shenanigans that I'm doing that internal to our spacecraft because I know it's a big, heavy external thing. Like it's 15 kilograms. And if you don't have the ability to very precisely adjust your weight, that's a, just a pain. Um, but it does look pretty cool with the little boom that extends off. Uh, but anyways, so we had all of that and we were uh, experimenting all sorts of different things. And the really exciting thing is we are going to get to experiment on that ourselves. Uh, we should get a fairly tremendous amount of science and a tremendous amount of money, which is good because we failed our Mars contract for sure. I showed you that pork chop plot. There's just nothing we can do outside of spending six or 7,000 meters per second of Delta V uh, to get 
get to Mars at this point. It's just lost to us for the next two years, which means we're going to fail that contract, which is a bummer. Uh, so we'll see what I can do about that. But uh, yeah, so that is it for this one for the next uh, 22 days. And we also have our launch pad is going to complete in just a moment. Um, yeah, so that's very, very cool. All right, so we have just now finished the fourth launch pad, which I have just left named launch pad four, which it's uh, 350 tons, which is fabulous. So we're going to just call that complex 350 reason to be weird about it uh meanwhile i'm getting a whole bunch of science from around the sun i don't know if you just uh i, I almost missed that but um yet intrepid three traveling around the sun has transmitted about 15 credits worth of science um around the sun so we are getting magnetic scans uh orbital perturbation experiments um all from around high orbit of the sun which is pretty darn fantastic um that is good because we have been like really behind on science we're actually at the point where we are our, our r d labs are not running but with that extra science that has just come in uh we can get some new stuff hmm so many things that i want to get all right, so I don't think that uh, there's anything super impactful that I can do right now. Um, not without a lot more science, but that that's coming. Uh, there's going to be a big bundle of science that we are working towards uh, today. Um, so I think in the meantime, we're going to unlock interplanetary probes because uh, that will get our R&D labs running and it will also get us uh, a procedural avionics upgrade, which is always fantastic and uh, really, really helpful, uh, especially now that we are going on more daring missions uh we're going interplanetary and so forth and have being able to cut down weight and power consumption is a fabulous thing all right here we are back with our intrepid three which uh we have a little maneuver to do um and I just want to show you why it's so good that uh Kerbalism just kind of determines what your solar panel exposure is and then cuts out and then like leaves it, saves it as that, and just kind of leaves that for the rest of uh, the probe's life, is because we have rotated around. And that would be a massive problem if we did not, if it tracked it in real time. But that would be, I think, impossible. I really can't imagine how it would simulate that without physically simulating the orientation of every craft at all times, which, you know, that sounds terrible. Uh, but anyways, we are here and we are ready. We have good signal. And, yep, we still have the instruction to point upwards towards the sun now that the avionics has been reactivated. So our RCS is turning us around towards that, uh, which is good. Uh, we want to be pointing in that direction uh, until such time as we need to make our burn, uh, which we are coming up on in about 10 hours. So let's take a look. We can see the distance that we have uh, that we have left Earth. Um We've kind of jumped out and back a little bit, slowing ourselves down. Slowing ourselves down relative to the uh, orbit of the sun, uh, which means that we will be falling behind Earth and then falling down and in towards Venus. Uh, we have... Let's see, still should be target. That's good. Focus. Just want to make sure that our um, upcoming maneuver node is doing what it's supposed to, and it's definitely not. Uh, things have changed over the time that we have um, been moving in that direction, uh, which is fine and expected because we've left the sphere of influence of Earth and now we are in... Uh, KSB is very good and accurate at tracking the very next thing that you're going to do. Um, when you start getting multiple nodes out, that's when uh, it gets a little complicated and dicey. I've refreshed our trajectory, our maneuver. Uh, we're still going to do it in about eight hours. Um, I find that it doesn't matter too much where along this path that you do it. So long as you do it far enough away, uh, you can make a huge impact on your intended trajectory. Um, so now with only 50 meters per second, I'm able to pull this down into a very tight um, flyby where we will slingshot around the planet and then uh, go hurtling off uh, roughly on the ecliptic uh, plane. Um, I've tried to keep it so that I'm not changing my, um, orientation all that much. So this is actually going to 
uh, change my inclination fairly dramatically so that I am now orbiting, hopefully, in the plane of Venus from now on. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty close. It's going to end up being pretty close. Uh, I'm a little bit inclined relative to Venus now. You'll see that the... So I apologize for how hard it is to see with the chaotic laser light show that's happening in the background. Uh, I really wish that that was not something that I had to deal with. Um, but when I'm trying to show you things on the map screen, that makes it very hard to, to focus. But you can see that Venus is still fairly inclined to our current orbit and also to the orbit of Earth. Um, but going into the orbit that I am, uh, going into this inclination with this uh, particular flyby, we are coming in like way from on top and then we are slingshotting around and it's kicking me out almost directly onto the ecliptic plane uh so into the inclination of venus so we are going to get free inclination change on our orbit and the idea that i have there is that maybe someday in the future in a couple years down the line i may accidentally encounter venus again and that will allow me to get the chance for another flyby um it's once again not something that I'm all that stressed about, but um, it's a fun thing to play with because I've never done gravity assists in RSS like I've mentioned. Uh, and just seeing just how incredibly potent it is uh, when you actually get them, like just how much it changes your orbit because like my normal orbit line should be going on a straight line from here to here, but the amount of delta V that I would normally have to expend to get this much change is huge. So... Fun thing to play with uh, and something that might be useful and something I plan to use in the future. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to find flybys. Like there's a flyby finder tool that I do not understand how to use. Um, so I may have to look into how to plan that sort of thing out so that I can do things like getting out to uh, Jupiter and Saturn uh, by first slingshotting off of Venus. In any case, I am going to put back uh, my alarm so that I can time warp without having to be stressed about it. All right, a couple minutes to our burn. Uh, we are unlocking our controls and we are preparing to uh, make this adjustment to our trajectory. And we have a lovely hydrazine thruster on here and plenty of hydrazine RCS. So there is no issue with this. This is not something that uh, can fail per test light. So from here, it's all just a matter of how well I plan, which uh, <laughs> is just as dangerous as uh, a test light failure, if you ask me. All right, so we are all set. Burn time is going to be about 30 seconds, apparently. So we are going to start the burn using uh, the, standard, the standard thing here, uh, maneuver tracker. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition. All right. Even this tiny amount of thrust is bringing up our parasite pretty dramatically. And the key that we want to get to is we want to get down. Uh, I don't actually know. Wait, yes, I do. It's uh, anything under six million meters is going to be low orbit. But we want to get real close and cozy. So now we are just going to cancel that and I am just going to, using fine controls, we are going to carefully bring it in to about 150 kilometers above Venus's surface. All right, absolutely fantastic. That is what we have for our... Um, for our encounter. So that is going to be a fabulous flyby. We're going to scream through uh, low space and grab a ton of wonderful science on the way. I am super excited about it. So let's go ahead and put down a sphere of influence alarm because I want to know when we get there because I think this will be a ton of fun to go through manually. Um, not manually. There's nothing manual that I'm going to be doing, but I want to like I want to be there. I want to watch it go by. It's going to be gorgeous. All right, so let's go ahead and point ourselves back. Uh, put our solar panels to the sun and our antenna pointed to Earth. Not that physical orientation actually matters in this game, but still. All right, and now that I've made those adjustments, I just want to make absolutely certain that I haven't changed my 
trajectory, and we have. This was going to kill us dead. All right, so just adjusting again now that we are pointing at the sun. I said 150. Please and thank you. I don't actually... I don't actually love how my... Um, See, that, that's changed a little bit. I don't like that. What can I do? Alright, well that took a lot of fiddling, but I got it back. Um, so let's just kill the rotation. And turn off <laughs> any guidance so that we don't mess up this trajectory. Yeah, because once again, I want to make sure that uh, what we do for free here is we bring down our orbit. Uh, so that we are inside the orbit of Venus. Um, but we also are going to be... Um, on the same inclination as Venus. And that is going to be incredibly important. That is the most important factor, in fact, about getting another flyby sometime in the future. So uh, that is where we will leave that. Let me just make sure everything is good. All right, now everything seems to be fine. I will turn off my avionics. There we go, perpetual everything. It's fabulous, wonderful, fantastic. And there we go. Now we are ready to go while we are doing a little bit of science on the way uh, on the way to Venus. All right, so Complex 350 is complete and looks no different from Complex 150. Uh, I honestly haven't uh, built anything yet. I don't have any payloads yet that need a 350 ton launch pad, but I imagine that I'm going to if I want to uh, extend my human spaceflight program and start putting like space station bits up and all that sort of thing. So it's something that I've done a little bit early, I guess. Um, but it's something that will come in handy very soon. And now that I have the ability to make uh, things like that, now I could be like, well, what can I do with 350, a uh, 350 ton launcher? Well, can I launch five satellites at once? So we'll be looking into that. Uh, but for now, we are going to roll out onto just a little tiny 60 ton pad because we don't need to do anything more than that for our Corona program. No, not that Corona. All right, here on the pad, a newly engineered and designed uh, rocket with a brand new engine that is going to ignite just fine. And away we go. We have ignition and have cleared the tower with our Thor Agena. Which I'm pretty sure this is the first time I've flown one of these. I may have flown a Thor Agena A. Now I'm trying to think back if I've actually ever flown one of these before. Did I skip straight to the Agena B? Um, anyways, we have here a newly designed version of our old standard. Um, the Thor rocket, which has a new uh, RS-27 slash H-1 um, engine uh, bolted on instead of the LR-79. The H-1, as I've discussed previously, is the uh, um, the, the booster for the Saturn 1 primarily, but the way that they have it set up, it, it can be used for kind of everything. So this, this actually has a model that is the exact same as the LR-79. Uh, there's also one that looks a little bit like the LR-89, and there's one that looks similar to the LR-89 but has um, no gimbal, and it's, so it's a little straighter, a little shinier. Um, so that is, it's an interesting engine because it's a little bit heavier, but a little bit more thrust. And the fuel mix that it uses, uh, it requires a little bit less fuel to get the same amount of delta V. So the overall impact is that I get about 100 meters per second more delta V with the same, basically the same configuration. Uh, but it's cheaper and it's more reliable, or it will be because this is the first launch of this thing, than the LR-79 or the LR-89 is. So I've actually replaced a lot of my um, usages of the LR-79s and 89s with uh, H1s. So yeah, that's going to be really good. That's going to be collecting good data that we're going to use long into the future because this is going to be a fairly standard booster for us. Uh, and thankfully, it looks like this has gone pretty darn well so far. I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, we are lofting now our Corona satellite, which uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, once I'm sure it's actually getting into orbit. Um, but yeah, so I've kind of gone through and rebuilt some of my my rockets because we have had a lot of upgrades and such and i think i've been like 
I've built a lot of my engines, a lot of my vehicle craft files uh, well in advance of actually flying them. And even by the time I flew them, I had upgrades that I didn't end up using because I didn't think to go in and edit each one and make sure everything was using the right, cra uh, the right uh, engine configurations and so forth. So I think a lot, well, not a lot of my failures, but some of my failures could even have been attributed to um, to not using the most up up-to-date engine configurations. All right, so I have turned off auto stage because MechJab has been having some issues with that. So I am just going to wait a little bit until we get closer to orbit or closer to our apogee before I fire this up. Now that we are out of the, just about out of the atmosphere, I think I can safely kick off this Thor stage. Thank you for your service. And we are preparing now for uh, the end of our coast and getting this into orbit. We are using, uh, by the way, let's talk for just a brief second about how lucky it was that there were no failures whatsoever. First launch of the H1C and it worked perfectly. Love it. Uh, now we have the Agena B, which we have used a couple times, but this is the new new model. So there was a model that we got that was the Agena A slash B that had like three con configs. And then there's now this one, which has another bunch of configs. Um, and it's twitching. That's just keeping itself exactly where it wants to be, I suppose. Um, but yeah, the engine bell on this one is a little bit longer. So it's a lot like the, the difference between the AJ-10 early and AJ-10 mid that way. Uh, yeah, so 5% ignition failure rate, but it lit up just fine. Um, and that's why we're down at 2000 data units at launch again, because once again, I've used uh, an old config uh, a couple times while I still had the new config ready and uh, able. All right, so uh, this is a Corona satellite, which I um, kind of have been forgetting to, I've been forgetting to put together for a long time. It's been, um, it's something that I could have done like years ago, but I just never really got around to for whatever reason. Like I completely forgot about it. I think I took one look at this big bulky unwieldy part and I went, ooh, that looks difficult. And then I moved on. Uh, but there's no reason to avoid it any longer. We have, um, definitely got the right uh, technology to get this into orbit and it will bring us home some science which is fantastic uh, so the corona satellite is we are getting now into a about 65 degree inclined orbit uh, that's going to be fairly low so we're only looking for a, a 300 kilometer uh, apogee and perigee it's nice circular uh, not eccentric orbit at all uh, and that is going to allow us to do a couple different experiments. So we have an early film camera, which is the kind that you're supposed to put on top of a V2 rocket and get out of the biomes local to you. But I'm still missing a bunch and we're going to be going into a heavily inclined orbit anyway. So I might as well snag some extra science while we're up here. Uh, and then we also have this big one, the improved film camera that is uh, the basis of this mission. And the mission profile is basically going to be the same as it was in real life, where uh, what was put up into orbit was this Corona satellite vehicle, which had um, a big camera on it um, and a whole big mechanism for how to uh, take pictures, because it was a surveillance satellite uh, launched by the U.S., uh, mostly to spy on the Soviets and the Chinese. Um, but it would take pictures and then it would like kind of kick them up into this... Um, film bucket that they called it like that's look look that up on the wiki it's actually called the film bucket and uh this would pop off of the corona satellite and then come back down um the corona program actually went on for many years it was a very successful surveillance program uh that they they used over a lot of time they learned a lot about taking pictures in space and returning science and uh I think that it is something that we could have, like I said, we could have been doing this a long time ago, and it's something we probably should have been doing because it would have really taught us how to bring home science capsules before I launch those poor little frogs. All right, so our Agena upper stage is doing fine work. This is, uh, I think, the Agena B at this point, or is it the Agena C with this upgrade? I'm not sure anymore. Uh, but it's a more modern engine that is uh, really quite capable and uh, I'm probably going to use a whole bunch because it does not ha it does not require high pressure tanks, which is very nice. 
Okay, so we have successfully gotten into orbit. Fantastic. So that's great. Um, and that we have gotten there with plenty of extra Delta V, which shows us that we can get stuff done on the 60 ton pad just fine. Let's go ahead and close this. And we can extend now our solar panels. I should have put that on an action group, but I did not. And we are going to point ourselves down towards the sun. That looks right. Okay, so this is going to point at the sun, and then I am going to leave this in orbit for a really long time. Um, the Photography 2 experiment uh, is two years long. And the way that I've had to design this is you have a two year long experiment and you can get samples at 0 0.2, which means you have to do this at least five times. And you know, I may pull the trigger early if I'm afraid that I'm going to lose one of these satellites. Um, so you have to do this at least five times, which means that each sample is gonna be 100 kilograms of mass. So this has the avionics to handle that, hopefully. Uh, I'll talk about more about the actual probe design in a moment but the idea is that we are in space low around the home body uh with inclination between 60 and 100 degrees eccentricity between 0.04 and uh, oh eccentricity of uh no more than 0 0.04 which i think we have just fine we are nearly perfectly circular thank you mech uh with a maximum altitude of 445 kilometers so all that to say that the experiment is running successfully. Check, 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 check. Um, so yeah, it even shows you here, it does the little division for you to show you how long that's going to be. Uh, but it's going to take two years, and then I think that that means that's about 146 days, I think. Uh, so each one of these is going to be up for about 146 days, uh, and then I will want to uh, kick off this little thinger and bring that down. But first, I think it's time for us to say farewell to our upper stage. So we have pointed us ourselves at the sun. That is just perfect. Uh, now, I think that's all we need. So let's go ahead and separate the upper stage. And then the... Uh, uh, controls are locked because no, this thing cannot maneuver itself in space. That was something that the actual Corona uh, satellites were able to do. They were stabilized in three axes so that they could point their camera at Earth at all times. Um, but there is no point in actually doing that uh, in RP-1. There's no reason for me to point in any direction or not point in any direction except for to point at the sun to make sure that we have power. Uh, and so we, it says here that we have perpetual power. Uh, our solar panels will degrade a little bit over time, but I'm pretty sure that we are not going to have any issues. So we are going to just go ahead and put in a timer of 146 days. There we go. And that is when we will want to bring down uh, this satellite uh, so before our upper stage gets too far, I think it's time for me to start doing the thing that I love to do, which is because this thing has another restart and still has control, I can straight up deorbit this upper stage. And I love it. I love uh, cleaning up debris manually. Um, I'll probably go through and delete some of my old debris because as neat as it is to have a whole bunch of stuff flying around, uh, I'm, I'm really not going to be able to... Um, uh, even with my very burly computer rig, I really don't want to burden it any more than I need to. This game is not super stable, is what I'm saying. Alright, so we are pointing retrograde, and I'm just going to fire up the engine and flip and change. Meow! <laughs> oh my gosh, okay, that, that looked really silly. Uh, but yeah, so that is going to deorbit, and uh, I will never have to worry about it again. All right, so let's talk about this probe. There's not a whole lot more to it than you have than you haven't already seen, but we have uh, just the film experiment. The improved film camera is the main body of the craft, and that's where I've attached these uh, solar panels. Um, 
the actual regular models like open up and have a big animation but for some reason they don't animate in rp1 and i've heard that that's deliberate but that was just like an offhanded comment in the discord so don't take that as like an official the official word but that's that's kind of what i've heard so i don't know uh it'd be nice if things opened up and animated and did some stuff but if it doesn't that's also fine and that's kind of what i've planned around then we have up here the uh, early film camera, which is going to be taking some pictures as well. Uh, and basically whatever extra room that we are not going to be using from our improved film camera, we're going to be uh, filling up with early film camera results. Uh, inside here, uh, kind of like our returner, we have um, basically just a shroud with a giant battery pack in here. Um, and then inside there is the teeny tiniest little rocket. So up here we have a procedural avionics with just some electric charge and so forth. And this is a um, deep space core, of course, because we are going to need to be able to activate this to control. Uh, and this is once again me having to plan ahead. Uh, it the, the This probe itself weighs like 200 something kilograms and it controls 320 kilo kilograms. So I should have 100 kilograms and a little bit of extra cushion. Uh, for controllable avionics and that should be what I need to get this thing home and underneath there is the 0.625 meter heat shield and a little tiny um, thruster that has 75 meters per second of delta v that should be enough to get us uh, into a into a suborbital trajectory or not a suborbital trajectory but it should be enough to get us down low enough uh, in the into the atmosphere to deorbit. And then we have some hydrazine uh, little thrusters up here to kind of mimic the uh, look and feel of the uh, science return capsule. But we've obviously rolled our own at this point. So this is our film return bucket with the parachute on top and all of that. And uh, this is built to kind of occlude everything up here. So hopefully it will not burn up on re-entry. Uh, so yeah, this is the Corona program. We're going to be launching uh, at least five of these. Uh, any failures are obviously going to require me to launch more, but that is going to eventually get us something like 200 science or more from the uh, other experiments that we have packed on here. And I think I even have yeah, uh, orbital perturbation and infrared, infrared radiometry attached to uh, the core as well. So we'll go ahead and run those, and I just want to make sure that that hasn't done anything bad to our power. Okay, yep, we are still fine on power. Uh, I want to go into the config. So this has only a level 1 antenna, tech level 1 antenna, because I didn't think I would need to re uh, actually transmit anything. But I am going to be transmitting the orbital perturbation and uh, infrared radiometry experiments. So that's actually not great. That's because these are going to collect more uh, more science than I'm going to be able to transmit. So we'll get some from this, but that's a failure on my part to not plan for that. Um, these uh, tech level one solar panels are actually capable enough to handle the bigger and better um, uh, encoders that are attached to the new uh, antennas in uh, tech level two and three. All right, so for automation, let's go ahead and we'll turn all the science on. And then if we have power low, what I want to do is I want to turn off everything including data transmission and then you can turn it back on once we have power again so I just want to make sure that we never lose control of this uh, entirely the science is secondary to being able to return this capsule back home and I was actually supposed to take a contract for an orbital return, but I uh, appear to have forgotten. <laughs> so that's going to have to be another mission. Uh, so yeah, this is Corona 1, the first of my Corona satellites. Hopefully this one goes well and gets us lots of science. Um, and then we will get a couple more. All right, so I've actually accepted contracts now that will uh, cover the missions that I'm running. Uh, I have plans on an uncrewed uh, Mercury mission coming up, so we're going to do the... That is going to be how we test the or do the uh, orbital flight and return safely uh, to Earth contract. 
Uh, I've also planned for a lunar landing, so that's pretty exciting, right? We're going to be sending a surveyor probe, uh, much like the real surveyor, uh, up to the moon to hopefully land and return a ton of science. So that is kind of the name of the game for me lately, is making sure that we have as much science as we possibly can, because I hate the, I, I hate the feeling of, having, of being stymied on that. Um, so... That means we have a whole bunch of money, uh, and I've already spent a big chunk of that. Uh, I had like 300,000 funds before, and I've spent most of that on um, unlocks and tooling for the new configurations of my rockets that I just showed you, the new Thor Agena and uh, the, new, um, the new version of the Tela that I have not quite shown you yet. Um, but I will in just a moment. Uh, so spending money on that is uh, what I've done up till now. So I think now it's time to spend some KCT points. Uh, we have two of them already from the science returns that I've gotten. Let's bring us down to about, yeah, there we go, 18 more points. So we are going to spend on that. And a couple of points in R&D just for good measure. All right, so it brings, up, uh, brings us up to about 140 points in the VAB which is lovely and is really cranking out these rockets pretty fast, which means <laughs> we're going to need to get up to 350-ton uh, rockets because we're going to feel like uh, things are moving too quickly otherwise. Uh, but we are making some real good progress now. We are really getting a lot of these missions underway. Uh, we've sent out something interplanetary. We're going to be able to fly by Venus and get a nice close approach, which is awesome. I'm really excited about that and the science that will return. Uh, we've got our first Corona probe up in orbit as well. So that's something uh, really fun that we have to look forward to. And you can see that we have on the pad ready to go my first unmanned test of a Mercury Tela rocket. So we are going to be preparing for our crewed space program, which uh, should be heading up like any minute now, probably the first thing next episode. So if you all enjoyed this episode, please let me know. Uh, like, subscribe, uh, leave me a comment. I really love hearing from everybody. And and uh, I will see you next time.